The Hidden Forces podcast features long-form conversations broken into two parts, the second hour of which is made available to our premium subscribers, along with transcripts and notes to each conversation. For more information about how to access the episode overtimes, transcripts, and rundowns, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. You can also sign up to our mailing list at hiddenforces.io, follow us on Twitter at Hidden Forces Pod, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest on this episode of Hidden Forces is Michael Sandel, professor of government theory at Harvard University Law School, host of the BBC series The Public Philosopher, and author of numerous best-selling books, including his latest, The Tyranny of Merit. I was inspired to invite Michael onto the podcast after seeing his work cited by Thomas Ricks in his book, First Principles, dealing with the subject of civic virtue or public-mindedness. But to be honest, I didn't go out looking to do an episode on meritocratic ethics or what makes for a good society. But as I reflected on what I wanted this discussion to be about, I kept coming back to this question about the public good or the common good, as Michael refers to it, and what's become of it. What's become of our sense of indebtedness to our community? And do we have a responsibility to participate in making it a better place, not only for ourselves and our families, but for everyone? I think we do. But I also think that our society has become so Darwinian in how we think about success and failure that many of us find it difficult to concentrate on anything other than our own survival. And when we do finally make it, It's easy to get swept up in feelings of entitlement and to tell ourselves comforting stories about how we deserve our station in life because of all the sacrifices we had to make, because of our hard work, our talents, and our willingness to take risks. Perhaps nowhere has this mentality around success and failure been more evident than in our response to this pandemic, where we've been continually assured by our public officials that we are all in this together. And yet, for those of us who have been working from home during this time, or who are economically independent enough to prioritize social distancing, take the necessary health precautions, and access the highest quality health services, this catchphrase rings hollow. We know it's not true. We know that there are two different realities for two different classes of people in this society, the winners and the losers. In my conversation with Michael, we try and understand how this happened, what it means for our society, and how we might begin to engage in the moral and political renewal required to fix it. And with that, please enjoy this thoughtful conversation with my guest, Michael Sandel. (music) Professor Michael Sandel, welcome to Hidden Forces. Good to be with you. It's great to be with you. How are you doing? Good, thanks. So are you up in Boston? I am in Boston. Yeah, at home and where I've been since the pandemic. All of our teaching has been remote this past semester, so I've scarcely stirred from my house. What's that been like for you? Well, the remote teaching actually has worked surprisingly well. There's been a lot of engagement. I've been teaching a version of my course, Justice, updated to include ethical issues related to the pandemic and to this moment of racial reckoning. The students have been very engaged and we've had a lot of participation and discussion. It works surprisingly well remotely. And then uh, I've been on what has been in effect a virtual book tour since my book, The Tyranny of Merit, came out in September. And the uh, it's a different kind of book tour, no traveling, which is a blessing, but endless hours upon hours from what essentially is a, a little home studio here that I've got. Yeah, that was the part that I enjoyed the most. I used to almost exclusively require guests to appear in our New York City studio. 
because yeah. I wanted to get a chance to meet them in person, which is one of the benefits of having a show like this. And I also found in-person conversations to be much more enjoyable. That's something that I picked up on with you as well, because I know that you're a very interactive teacher. So I was wondering how the pandemic and the in-home learning has impacted that for you. Well, I miss the direct personal engagement with audiences and uh, especially with student audiences, because a lot of the energy from the interactive talks and lectures depends on that. And yet, I've been pleasantly surprised at the extent to which it's been possible to replicate that element of interaction and engagement remotely. And I've done a number of television programs in various countries that involve interacting with participants. I've continued a, a series I've been doing for the BBC called The Global Philosopher, where we mm. bring people together from from as many as 40, 50 different countries to debate an issue. And it's uh, actually that experience, I think, has helped prepare me for this because when we bring people together from different countries, we've had to do it even before the pandemic remotely. And it is surprising how much engagement and interaction it's been possible to achieve in this way. Yeah. One of the things that I thought about while you were talking about both teaching while at the same time promoting your book is how podcasting has or hasn't changed the experience of being a student in college. Because if I were, if I was, I went to school at NYU, for example, and if I were taking a moral philosophy class at NYU, but I had a chance to hear, let's say, Michael Sandel speak about it in the context of this book, would I be listening to those podcasts? Do you find that students from other universities are reaching out to you because they find your material online? And so in a sense, you're teaching a much broader audience of students? Yes. Now, the class this semester was only Harvard students. Uh, we, uh, although oh, they... I, mean, I mean, like, for example, if you're appearing on this podcast, if there's a student in the University of Illinois, for example, who hears the podcast and reaches out to you and says, hey, I really enjoyed hearing your lecture. I'm also a student of moral philosophy, and I yes. found your conversation with Dimitri helpful. Yes, yes, there is a lot of that, a surprising degree of of that. And and we did an early experiment with my justice class before there were MOOCs and before online learning got going in earnest. Some years ago, we filmed it, uh, including the interactive dimension, and uh, put it, made it freely available on television and online so that anyone anywhere could take essentially my Harvard course on justice. And we didn't know what would happen. We had no idea that tens of millions of people would want to watch lectures about philosophy online. And I was really uh, amazed by the response and a lot of students from different countries around the world you know, began emailing. And then we made a, a version of it available uh, on the edX platform, which enables, you know, even higher levels of participation. But it is, I've been interested for some time in experimenting with the use of new technologies really to open access to the classroom so that higher education can be a public good, not simply a private privilege. Mm. That's really cool. You know, I, I enjoy that just having this podcast. I can't imagine how empowering it must be as a professor, like to be able to teach so many students and reach so many people. So let's actually get into the, the reason that you're here, which is to talk about your latest book, The Tyranny of Merit. What is this like your 20th or 25th book or something like that? <laughs> not, not quite. No. No, I don't know. Uh, eight or nine or something like that. I, I don't know. It's hard to tell remember. because you've translated so many. So many of them are translated in different languages. So you'll get on Amazon, you'll get a bunch of the, the same version of the book, but it's maybe you got a different title because it was published in the UK or it's published in Italian. Or, well, if you count the foreign, all right, if you count the foreign language right. versions, the books, the recent books have been translated into about 30 foreign languages. So I suppose that's how you get up there, Dimitri. So how do you describe yourself? This is a question I've started to ask my guests lately, which is how do you describe yourself or how would you describe yourself, not to your students, not to your colleagues, but to 
people who have never met you before and don't know anything about your profession, about philosophy, what would you say that you do? What I do is I teach political philosophy. That's what I do. And if people ask, what is political philosophy? My answer would be, it's a way of reflecting on the justice of our society, on on politics, on the way we seek after the common good, the way we disagree. So I'm curious when that reflection began for you. In other words, when did you become interested in moral questions? I know you said you're a political philosopher, but so much of what you're describing here, justice, the common good, how to disagree, deal with questions of moral philosophy. Because when I was growing up, when I was a kid, I wasn't really interested in moral questions. I was interested in existential questions to the extent that I was interested in any philosophical questions. It was, what is the nature of the world? What happens to me when I die, etc. And as I've gotten older, I found myself more interested in moral questions. And we actually did an episode with Rebecca Goldstein where it was focused entirely on this, on the question of moral philosophy. And we did another one with Jim Holt, the philosopher of science, who similarly made the point that in his older age now, he has become more engaged in these types of questions and ethical dilemmas. I'm curious, one, when did your interests in, in moral philosophy begin or maybe philosophy in general? And then the, the other question is, was there a progression over the course of your life around what aspects, what branches of philosophy you were interested in? Well, th th these are fascinating questions. I would start, Dimitri, by saying that I take moral philosophy to be about the question of what is a good life and how can we live a good life. Now, that question is very closely connected to political philosophy, which is how should we live together? And some people draw quite a sharp distinction between moral and political philosophy. Moral philosophy is about what ought to be, how we ought to behave, whereas politics is about how we live together and contend with our disagreements. But as I see it, we can't really discuss the question or think about the question, how should we live together, the question of politics. We can't really work that out without addressing moral questions. What is the good life? Because I don't think we can even answer the question, what is the good life for me, for oneself, without thinking about how can we develop ourselves, cultivate good character, cultivate habit, good habits and virtues. We can't think about those questions without living in a society and engaging with others and reasoning with others about the best way to live. So that's just to say that I think moral philosophy and political philosophy are continuous. I don't really see them as separate subjects. Now, how did I become interested in them? I think I became interested first in political philosophy. And that grew out of an interest growing up in politics, in actual concrete everyday politics. How do you mean that? Your family was political? My family was not especially political, but I remember growing up even in school, I don't know, in seventh, eighth grade, maybe before, following elections very closely, tracking the votes state by state, bringing into school posters where I assembled state by state the breakdown of the congressional and senatorial elections. Following the news, I was a news junkie. I watched the, the news every night. So I was always interested in the nitty gritty of politics. And I thought maybe when I grew up, I would, I would go into politics run for office. I wasn't sure, but I ran for office when I was in high school. I was the president of my student body. So I was very interested in actual concrete politics as a kid. And I was also in high school a debater. I was very interested in arguing, though debate tournaments are really not so much philosophical as they are exercises in 
persuasion, which is somewhat different. It's about winning and losing rather than getting at the truth. But still, I had this early fascination with politics and with debate. And I didn't really study much philosophy as an undergraduate. I was interested, I majored in politics and government, studied history, studied economics. And it wasn't really until graduate school when I went off to Oxford uh, that I figured I would study philosophy for a couple of terms really just to fill in my background. And then I would return to the concrete questions that interested me. But what I found was I became hooked by philosophy in graduate school and never really quite emerged. And so I spent four years in graduate school. I wrote a dissertation on the political philosophy of contemporary liberalism. And that became my first book. Then I began teaching. So my idea of actually going into politics fell by the wayside. I had been very interested also in political journalism. And I worked briefly as a political journalist when I was in college. I even had the opportunity in the summer of 1974 to work as a journalist for a newspaper in Washington. And that was the summer of the impeachment hearings of Richard Nixon. Hmm. So I was able to cover Watergate and the impeachment hearings and wow. the Supreme Court arguments and whether Richard Nixon would have to turn over the White House tape recordings he had secretly kept. So this was a dream come true for a political junkie. But as I say, I later, shortly after that, found myself in graduate school reading philosophy and fascinated by it. Uh, but I always wanted to connect philosophy to the world, hence my interest in public philosophy alongside teaching. But this is a long roundabout way of answering your question. My interest in moral philosophy as such emerged as I was uh, studying philosophy as a graduate student. But I saw it then and still see it is really continuous with political philosophy. Moral and political philosophy is really the subject that I, that I teach. I don't know if I've told you this, but I came across your work. It wasn't the first time. I'm sure I've run through your videos in the past on YouTube, but I've never actually read any of your previous books, which is rather shocking because you're a very um, successful philosopher and public intellectual. But I came across your work while reading Thomas Ricks's book, his recent book, First Principles, he quotes you a number of times. And of course, he deals very much with questions of virtue and public mindedness. And as I mentioned, your, your book's subtitle is What's Become of the Common Good, which is another way of talking about questions of virtue and the public good. What do you mean when you talk about the common good? And what do we mean generally as a society? Caring for one another and bringing a, the common good is about acting on the sense in which we are all in this together. Our fates are connected, not only in narrow economic terms, not only in terms of national security, but our fates are connected insofar as we aspire to live good lives. We can't fully live good lives without being good citizens which means we have to debate about what we owe one another as citizens. That's what I mean by the common good. Have you seen this? Do you think this has changed our relationship to the public and our, our sense of personal responsibility towards a, a larger common good? Has that changed in the course of your lifetime? Yes. I think over the past... Well, in the book, I'm mainly commenting on what's happened over the last four decades, since roughly speaking 1980, when I think we our politics has become less and less oriented to the common good. And in fact, to the point where now we are deeply polarized. The, the rancor, the partisanship that afflicts politics today is antithetical to the idea of a politics oriented to the common good. And so I began writing 
this latest book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, trying to make sense of the events of 2016, and especially of the election of Donald Trump, also to some extent the vote in, in Britain for Brexit, trying to understand what had brought us to this deeply polarized condition. And it seems to me that this polarization, the anger, the rancor, the resentments that run right through our social and political life have taken us far from a politics of the common good. So the book is partly a diagnosis of how we became so deeply polarized. And it's also, also has a kind of affirmative project, which is to ask what would be the conditions for emerging from the rancor and polarization toward a politics oriented toward the common good. That's the affirmative, that's the hopeful side of the book. So the way in which our society has become, I think, more selfish and self-centered and egoic, I mean, I, I've seen it. I think it's true. I think also we've become more obsessed with money. I know money is something that you've talked about in one of your previous books. Right. I think, I mean, that's something else that I've seen in, in the course of my life. I think this intersects also with the larger theme of your book, which is actually about something that has been with us since the very beginning. This idea of that we live in a meritocracy and that outcomes in such a society, as opposed to say in an aristocracy where privileges are afforded to people based on their birth, are by definition just because we've earned them by virtue of our own merits. Now there's a, a larger philosophical argument to be made about whether or not there's anything that we can actually claim to have merited in the first place. But putting that aside for a moment, even if we were to agree that outcomes in an ideal meritocracy are just in the sense that we each get what we deserve, it's not at all apparent that such a society would either produce outcomes that were morally acceptable to us or that such a society of winners and losers at the extreme ends would ultimately be politically stable. But I wonder, what do you think about that? It's a great question. I do see right at the heart of the polarization, a deepening divide between winners and losers that's been getting more acute in recent decades, Dimitri. And I think this divide is not only about the growing inequalities of income and wealth. I think it has also to do with the changing attitudes toward winning and losing that have come with the deepening inequality. Over the last four decades or so, those who landed on top came to believe that their success was their own doing, the measure of their merit. And by implication, that those who struggle, those who've been left behind, have no one to blame but themselves. Now, this way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive idea, and it's the meritocratic idea, that if chances are more or less equal, then the winners deserve their winnings, which goes to the point you just mentioned. The idea is that those who land on top having exercised their efforts and talents, deserve the material rewards that come from, that we lavish on the successful. And so you mentioned two different strands to my critique of this meritocratic idea. And the two strands are these. First, we don't fully live up to the meritocratic principles we proclaim. It isn't really true that we have a level playing field. So even though everyone, for example, is free to take the SAT, SAT scores for college admission are highly correlated with family income. The more affluent your family, the greater the likelihood you will score high on the SAT. Here's another measure of, of this, Dimitri. At, Ivy League colleges and universities, there are more students who come from the top 1% of families 
in terms of income than come from the entire bottom half of the country combined. And this is despite generous financial aid policies and scholarships. So part of the problem is we don't live up to the meritocratic principles we proclaim, even though a meritocracy prides itself, unlike an aristocracy, of enabling everyone to rise based on their talents and efforts, we fall far short. But, and this gets to the second strand that you mentioned, that's not the only problem. The argument I make in the book is more thoroughgoing as a critique of meritocracy than that. Even if we could somehow create a perfectly equal opportunity, a truly level playing field, even then, meritocracy would not be just. It would be a mistake to assume that those who landed on top due to effort and talent morally deserved all of the benefits that flow from the exercise of their talents. And we can get into the, to the reasons why this would not be morally the case, why it would be a mistake for the successful to assume that they deserved all the benefits that flowed to them. We can get into that, but it's important to distinguish these two different aspects of the critique of meritocracy. First, that we don't really live up to it. And second, even if we did, there'd be something morally unsatisfying about it. So let's focus on that second one. Yeah. Why would it be a mistake to assume that we are entitled to the proceeds of our of our efforts, of our winnings, of our victories in this, you know, more yeah. or less meritocratic society? Right. One way of seeing this is by taking a concrete example of someone who is highly successful. Take someone from the world of sports. LeBron James, for example, is a great basketball player. And he is handsomely remunerated for it. He makes, how much does he make? A hundred million dollars counting endorsements, maybe? Something more, that, I'm sure, much is more. Is it more than I that? Think, yeah, he's worth a lot more. Counting than that. his salary and licensing and endorsements and so on. Now, so what is the basis of the claim, or what would be the basis of a claim that he morally deserves that vast bounty? Well, he works hard. That's certainly true. He practices and has practiced to cultivate his skills over a lifetime. But he's also very gifted as an athlete. I could practice day and night forever and never be a great basketball player, much less as great a player as LeBron. So it surely can't be effort alone. What about the talents and gifts? Is it his doing that he is, has those remarkable athletic talents and gifts, or is that his good luck? And more than that, what about the fact that he lives in a society that loves basketball, creating an enormous market for his talents? Is that his doing? Of course not. That too is his good luck. If LeBron lived back in, in the days of the Renaissance, they weren't so crazy about basketball back then. They cared more about fresco painters. But this example illustrates, Dimitri, is that there are two elements of contingency, at least two elements of contingency, in, in generating the material rewards that flow to the successful. The element of luck and good fortune in having the talents to succeed, and even more so, the element of good fortune in living in a society and at a time when the talents that you or I have in abundance happen to be prized. Neither of those is really our own doing. And once we see that, once we appreciate the role of luck and good fortune in life, once we realize how indebted we are for the talents we have, 
for the degree to which society appreciates and rewards those talents. Well, once we recognize all of that, we, I think, are inclined to inhale a little bit less deeply of our own success. We're in, more inclined to recognize our good fortune, our sense of indebtedness. And this, I think, can be a powerful corrective to what I call the meritocratic hubris of some among the successful who assume that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit. So some people, I mean, regardless of their talents, we all have to make sacrifices. I'm sure that LeBron has had to make many. It's easy to, I think, at this stage because of his success to overlook those and most of them we won't even know what they are but for other people it's much harder to overlook them you know the classic sort of blue collar uneducated immigrant from south america who came across the border and built let's say started washing dishes eventually bought his own diner restaurant etc and built a life for himself which was pretty much i guess in this hypothetical geared mostly towards his family in order to help them have a better life, et cetera, et cetera. How do we value someone's sacrifices? In this case, this individual made choices to forego his own personal satisfactions or pleasures or material comforts in order to build wealth that is shared by other people. How do we value that? How do we think about entitlement, in other words, in the context that they're, regardless of my gifts and my talents, different people make different sacrifices in life? Right. Well, the sacrifices you're describing and that are so much a part of the, the immigrant story of a of great many people whose parents and grandparents have sacrificed so that they could live better, richer lives, the way I think we, we should think about those sacrifices is with appreciation, with love, with admiration and with a sense of humility because what being aware of those sacrifices can do for us is that those of us who have enjoyed various forms of success or achievement, thanks to the sacrifices of our forebears, of our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, being aware of that legacy and being aware of those sacrifices is to be alive to the sense of indebtedness that should temper our own hubris, that should rein in our own tendency to assume that our success is our own doing rather than the product of a history, a life history, a family history, as well as a social circumstance that enables me to flourish. So carrying that story of sacrifice through a memory of a family or ultimately a historical memory is an important moral resource in tamping down our tendency as individuals in the here and now, in the immediate present to assume that whatever success we enjoy must be our own doing. Do you see what I'm suggesting? You're suggesting that a sense of context and history is what's needed in order to develop a sense of humility and gratitude? Yes. Indebtedness, a sense of indebtedness, which is often connected to an awareness of those who made my opportunities possible, especially within a family setting, but also ultimately within a community and, and within a country, that what, what's missing if we fail to recognize and to keep alive the memory and appreciation of that history of sacrifice, we are more inclined. And it's almost, it's a slide that is hard to resist, but we should resist it into thinking because I work hard. My success must be entirely my doing and therefore I must deserve whatever flows from it. And what this leaves out is precisely the gratitude, the sense of indebtedness to those who made my success possible. How important is empathy? Well, empathy is important 
I would put it this way. Here's one way of accounting within this picture that we've been discussing and that I try to develop in the book. Here's how empathy might arise. First, it's worth thinking about how we may be cut off from the ability to empathize with the plight of others less fortunate than ourselves. The more I think of myself as self-made and self-sufficient, the harder it is to picture myself in other people's shoes. Whereas the keener my sense of indebtedness, my sense of gratitude to those who've gone before, the keener my sense of, of the role of good fortune is in understanding my success, mm. the more open it makes me to the condition of other people who struggle, the easier it is to imagine myself in other people's shoes there, but for the accident of fortune, I can tell myself, or the grace of God, or the, or the mystery of fate, there, that could be me. And you could call this capacity to identify with others, you could call it empathy, you could call it solidarity, or more broadly, a sense of, of obligation or responsibility for the community as a whole, especially those who struggle. And this gets us back to what we were discussing earlier, Dimitri, about the common good. The less I think of myself as indebted to luck or fortune or the sacrifices of my grandparents, let's say, the harder it is to think of my fate as bound up with the fate of others, including those who struggle. So this is how the meritocratic idea of success as self-made, the meritocratic idea that the successful deserve the rewards, the market showers upon them, this meritocratic idea cuts against a politics of the common good. It makes it harder to see ourselves as sharing one another's fate. It makes it harder to see ourselves as being all in this together, which is why the ideal of the common good is the one I juxtaposed to a highly individualistic conception of merit and moral desert. Mm. Yeah, I, I reflected some a bit on, on this. Um, again, this has always been, we've always thought of ourselves as living in a meritocracy. This isn't a recent phenomenon. But the increased emphasis on the individual seems to be something, and this, I guess, larger selfishness and obsession with money does seem to be something that has grown in, in recent decades. And I really, I wonder why that is. It's not something that we really discussed. I'd be curious to get your view on that. Also, something else that came to mind is that while I wasn't you know, a non-empathetic human being, I have found that in my life, as a result of going through difficult periods and enduring suffering, I've become more empathic. And as a result of that, that's made me more appreciative and more humble and increased my level of gratitude. And to that point, actually, I, I'm a, the audience knows this, I, in my very late 20s, I developed a brain tumor, which over the course of four years caused dementia and cognitive decline. And I was a television producer, I had my own television program and I've been pretty successful in my own right. But I had always, while I acknowledged that I was fortunate to have had, you know, good role models and a really great education, et cetera, et cetera, I never attributed my ability to do my job and my ability to create art, to be creative, period, to anything other than my own skills. And I felt that I, I merited the proceeds that came from that, right. whatever those were. Right. But what I found was as I developed symptoms from my tumor, eventually I was unable to work. And I came to this real realization, and it wasn't until actually after I had surgery and I got all of my skills back. I mean, some of them came immediately. Some of them, I just needed some time to redevelop them. I realized actually that by having had something, losing it, and then regaining it, 
that I really was the fortunate beneficiary of this ability, that I hadn't done anything to earn it. I was born with it and I cultivated it, but even the desire to cultivate it and also my work ethic and my endurance, that was also very much a physical trait that I inherited. In fact, everything was. And that really gave me a sense of humility and gratitude that I've tried to hold with me ever since and which I did not have up until that point in my life. So those are kind of three different points. I'm, you can you know, feel free to address them as you like. Well, it's very powerful, Dimitri, what you've said. And this is the first time I've, I've been privileged to hear your story. And what strikes me is you use the language of humility and gratitude, which I think is the apt and, and it's a resonant language. And this connects very powerfully with the central moral theme of my book, The Tyranny of Merit. Because one way of describing the tyranny of merit is that it drives out humility and gratitude, just as you've expressed them very powerfully. And this in a way connects to the common good. It also connects to the question we were discussing earlier about moral and political philosophy and their relation. Humility and gratitude are virtues, they're qualities of character, they're moral sentiments and attitudes. But they also have a political significance because the capacity for humility and gratitude are important for any society that aspires to a politics of the common good. Having a sense of humility and gratitude in the face of our gifts or talents achievements or material success is the first step toward enabling us to ask the question, what do we owe one another as fellow citizens? And what are our responsibilities for those less fortunate than ourselves, whether because of circumstance or the accident of gifts and talents? What do we owe one another? So here is how humility and gratitude on the one hand, which are moral categories, are deeply connected to the political aspiration to the common good. One way of, of reframing the main argument of my book, The Tyranny of Merit, is that the kind of market-driven meritocratic picture of success that has claimed us in recent decades is at odds with cultivating humility and gratitude and therefore has contributed to polarized politics by making it hard to imagine the common good. What it's brought instead, the tyranny of merit, is a society of winners and losers, and moreover, a society in which the winners tell themselves and are told by the society that they deserve to have landed on top. And that message, that's really what I'm referring to, is the tyranny of merit. And that message makes it very hard to bring about a society of solidarity, oriented to the common good, because it teaches us, those of us who enjoy some measure of success, it teaches us that we are self-made and self-sufficient. And that's at odds. That closes us off to the possibility of humility and gratitude. So this is really prompted, Dimitri, by a response to the personal experience that you were describing. I have some further thoughts in response to the first part of your question about how old and how new is meritocracy and, and why did it seem to have intensified in recent times. But before I get to that, what do you make of this, this account that, I mean, really drawing on your own very poignant and eloquent account about humility, gratitude, and 
the common good. What do you make of it? Yeah, I think those things are important. I, one of the thoughts that I also had was, can humility and gratitude be inspired in others? Or do we need to undergo challenging challenging circumstances in our lives in order to appreciate the caprice of life? Right. And I mean, obviously, certain people grow up in religious settings where they're taught some of those values. You know, that's one thought that I have because not everyone can undergo the, the suffering necessary or you don't want everyone to have to undergo the suffering necessary in order to develop those qualities. And not everyone that does suffer does develop them. So, right. you know, I, I guess from a practical standpoint, I wonder, you know, what can we do to cultivate those qualities in each other? Because I think that on a practical note, especially in a, in a democratic republic, premised on meritocracy, it's very difficult to see how such a society can sustain itself over time when you have more and more people living undignified lives, feeling disempowered and feeling like losers, right. which I think that was a powerful point that you made. I don't think it should be overlooked, which is that we, our society self-segments into winners and losers. And people who are winners think of themselves as winners, which you clearly articulated. But the flip side of that is that an increasingly larger segment of the society thinks of itself as losers. Yeah. And besides the the psychosomatic fallout that comes from that, there's also political fallout, which speaks to your point about the rise of, I think, populism, whether that populism is expressed in right-wing populism or left-wing populism, which I think is just as likely to develop. I think it reflects people's sense of disempowerment and the, the desire to sort of assert control over the system of government, which they feel like increasingly doesn't represent them. Right, right. Well, let me say first a word about the so-called losers, it certainly is true that as the divide between winners and losers becomes more acute, not only does the system generate hubris among the winners, which is what we've been discussing so far, it also generates humiliation and demoralization and a sense of disempowerment among those who lose out. And we've seen a tragic expression of this with the increase in recent years of deaths of despair, which is to say deaths by, by suicide, drug addiction, and alcohol. We've seen this especially among working class populations who feel not only that their, their wages are stagnant and job prospects are limited, but that the society no longer honors and affirms and respects the kind of work they do, the contributions they make. This is deeply demoralizing. And they sense that elites look down on them. And part of my account of the way meritocracy has contributed to the divide between winners and losers is to try to show that they're not wrong about that. That is, those working people who feel they are looked down upon by highly credentialed, well-educated elites, they're not wrong to think so. And the grievance and the resentment that develops feeling humiliated, that's a legitimate grievance, entangled though it sometimes becomes in very ugly sentiments. So I think it is worth noticing that the divide between winners and losers is humiliating to those who lose out in a way that creates the conditions for the populist backlash against elites that we've seen with Donald Trump and we've seen in other countries with authoritarian populists who, who manage to tap into this sense of grievance, to this sense of of being looked down upon as a loser. And this accounts for, I think, the rancorous politics that we have. And it explains much of the source of appeal of the, the populist parties and political figures who channel this sense of grievance. Now, to get back to the first part of your question about what we could do to cultivate humility and gratitude in a society. 
I think there's no single route to it. You mentioned that for some, religious faith and education can be a source of this. For others, moments of suffering can be a source of humility and gratitude. But I think there are other sources too that have to do, that can be encouraged by a healthy kind of civic life and civil society. Civic education. Civic education is more than just teaching young people how the government works or what the constitution says. Civic education should be an education ideally in learning to identify and sympathize with neighbors and citizens from all walks of life. That's civic education for a democracy, broadly conceived, has to be that kind of education. And that requires class mixing institutions like the public schools, but also class mixing institutions that we inhabit in the course of our everyday lives. Public places and common spaces that bring people together mm. across differences of race and ethnicity and class. And part of what's happened to our society in recent decades is that we have lost these institutions, class mixing gathering places, so that those who are affluent and those who are of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We live and work and shop and play in different places. We send our kids to different schools. And so one of the ways we learn humility and gratitude and a sense of sharing a common life is by living in the kind of society that does not separate us in separate parks and recreational facilities and health clubs and schools and systems of transportation and so on, but mixes us, provides class mixing occasions. Hmm. So this, I think the seed beds of this kind of civic education and humility and gratitude and the common good requires that we try to reweave the fabric of a shared civic life. Yeah, I think this has become less prevalent or more difficult to achieve in part because of money and what money can buy you today. Right. It can buy you so much more than it used to be able to. In fact, you actually have a meditation on this in the book regarding the recent school admissions scandal with right. the, I forget now the names of the, Lori Loughlin was maybe one of her names, uh, one of the actresses, the couple of the actors and and interestingly, also, the book draws a distinction between donating, let's say, a million dollars for a building at a university and increasing the chance that your child might get in versus paying under the table. In both cases, there's a level of unfairness there. For those of us who had to get in, quote, on the merits, yeah. both of those seem unfair. But of course, one is clearly illegal and the <laughs> other isn't. But I, you know, I think that's a really difficult one to solve. And I wonder... I wonder if you've looked at all at both societies in time and place. So let's say the Israeli society where everyone has to undergo military service or or circles in American society where people who, are, let's say, are more affluent. I don't know if studies have been done to look at this. Let's say more affluent children that go to the military and comparing their sense of community and obligation to affluent children that don't. And that speaks to this thing about public spaces and having a way to mix with people because, again, money... One of the privileges it buys you is you don't have to play by the rules. You know, you can, as I, you've talked about in other lectures, you can, if you're in prison, you can buy a better room in, in certain, in certain <laughs> institutions, right. which is just, you know, it's wild to me. Something else I want to tease as well, which I want to talk about with you as we move into the overtime, is again this educational divide, because this is not the first time that we've experienced this level of wealth disparity in America. The last time that it was this large was in the 1920s, roughly. Right. And this was a period in time when eugenics were theories of genetic difference in order to account for varied performance and stations in life were gaining traction and were increasingly popular. So you had, you had a genetic biological explanation during this period of time. And today you have an environmental one, which is education. Interestingly enough, the environmental one 
I think, lends itself more to the meritocratic ethic. I wonder qualitatively how those two justifications impact our sense of entitlement. Because again, this is something else that came up for me while I was reading your book, and I, I wondered about it, which is I think you made the point numerous times that what's particularly dangerous, and I think you made it here as well, about meritocracies or the meritocratic ideal, believing in it too firmly, or the meritocratic ethic, is that we, we feel that we are more entitled to the life that we live. I wonder, though, how true that is, because I think you know, aristocratic societies or societies where we have the divine right of kings, I wonder if those people felt less entitled to their station in life or if they felt just as entitled or more entitled because they felt blessed to hold that position, for example. Those are just some thoughts heading into the overtime. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of my conversation with Professor Sandel, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so that you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Professor, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.